Hey, good morning. Yes, yes, it is getting cool. It's getting fall. I love this. You'll actually see me in pants over the next couple weeks, all right? I haven't gotten there yet because it's still in the 80s, all right? But uh, my name is Corey. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so glad that you guys are joining us today. Uh, we are in this series called Endgame, and this is the second week of the series called Endgame. Uh, and if you were here with us last week, you got the concept, but if you weren't, let me just give you a little bit of a quick recap. When, when we're talking about the word Endgame, what we're saying is, is everybody's got an Endgame. Everybody's got a, a mission. We got a, a vision. You got a destination. You got a you got a there to go to. That's what we're talking about when we're when we're speaking of an end game. And every single one of us as an individual has an end game. At the same time, every church actually has an end game. And so we've been talking about what does it look like for Sunnyside Christian, not only now but also in the days to come. What does our end game look like? And, and last week, what we what we learned is that the first job of a leader. The very first job of a leader is to define reality, to define reality. A, a leader can't come in and be overly optimistic because they won't be able to see the problem, and they can't be overly pessimistic because then they won't be able to see the solution. They need to be able to, to put the, the right things into place, to have the right kind of conversations, to see the right kind of statistics, to be able to define reality properly so that we understand how to get from here to there. And as we talked about last week, as we put all these things together, as we've had conversations and we've talked with our leadership, as we've seen the statistics on the, on the screen, what we've determined is that we can't stay here. In the life cycle of our church, it was hard for us to hear this, but, but as we saw the things that we saw last week, we, we understand that we're on a trajectory of a dying church. That's, that's the trajectory we're on. But I got good news for you guys. We're not dead yet. Anybody give me an amen on that? And here's the reason why we're not dead yet is because we are not gonna stay here. We're not gonna stay here. And I gotta tell you, I was incredibly encouraged. I was incredibly encouraged this past week by some of the conversations I've had with you guys uh, online and in person and in, in the lobby. I had several of you guys kind of come up to me and, 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 and kind of repent maybe of your bad attitudes in the midst of some transition and understanding that, that not every change that we make is gonna be the things that you necessarily want. And, and I appreciate your heart because you're, you're, you're willing to say, you know what, whatever it takes, because we're not gonna stay here. I had several emails from you guys this week just encouraging me and, and telling me and our leadership, thank you for having the necessary conversation. I know it's gotta be hard, but it's the very right thing for us to do. And so thank you for sending those emails, offering some suggestions and encouragement and, and, and additional questions of clarification. I also, there was a few of you guys that were, they were tearing up about this situation. Not, not unlike Nehemiah did. You allowed the news of, of what's happening here to kind of break your heart because you're dedicated to this place. You're committed to this group of people. And you allowed that to break your heart a little bit, not because, not because you were sad about something, but because you started to realize for the first time that many, many of you guys know and you've understood that we're not been, we've not been hitting like on all cylinders, but last week was the first time that you were able to see the reality as it actually is and how we can't stay here any longer. And last week I introduced you guys to a little bit of a, of a concept, an illustration when we talked about here to there. And I've got this graph up there to show you all this a little bit. But, but really anybody who is trying to lead people anywhere is doing this very thing. They're trying to take people from where they're at currently to where they need to be. They're trying to take people from here to there. But very rarely, very rarely does, does the pain of staying here ever exceed the pain of what it takes to get there. And that's why we had to have this necessary conversation last week to define the fact that we can't stay stay here any longer. But I got good news. Today, we get to talk about where is there. And, and I got to tell you, I'm a whole heck of a lot more excited about talking about there today than I was about talking about where we're currently at uh, last week. And so what we're going to be doing is, is as a way to be able to talk about there um, and just our situation, our scenario, um, I find a lot of similarities and compliments to the story of Nehemiah. And, and if you were with us last week, you know that we kind of concluded our message by kind of introducing you to Nehemiah and his story. Well, we're actually going to pick up there today and we're going to use that as a springboard to have some conversation. And so if you got your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn to Nehemiah chapter, chapter two. We're going to get there here here in just a moment, but just by way of recap, I'm going to give you all a little bit of information to help catch you all up. Some of you are familiar with the story of Nehemiah. Others of you have no clue who this guy is, all right? Uh, and so I encourage you all last week to do this. I'll encourage you again this week. Uh, if you don't know the story, go back and read the book of Ezra and, and Nehemiah. They're in the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament of our Bible, and that will give you some context of, of these people and what they're going through and what they're trying to accomplish, and you'll start to see some of the similarities in the 
concepts of truth that we're going to be presenting in our conversation. So in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, what we see is uh, we see him uh, in, in a state of, of captivity, all right? Uh, the Israel has been in a state of uh, the Babylonian captivity. We got a little map up here to show you some stuff. Uh, but basically, these guys have been exiled from their country, and now they've then been sent back. And so you have the remnant that have gone back to Judah, and they've started to rebuild the city, uh, specifically the temple. Uh, but Nehemiah is still back in Babylon, and he's serving the king. And so some of his friends come back, and they give him a report of how things are going and they're not winning. It's not going good. They're in a bad situation and he hears about this and he allows that news to break his heart and he allows that to, to cause him to mourn and to fast and to, and to pray and, and, and then he takes a personal assessment of his own life and he realizes that if I'm gonna allow this thing to move me, then I can't stay here. Regardless of his plush position, regardless of, of where he's at, these guys are all the way over in Judah and he's in Babylon. He's got a pretty good scenario and situation, but he decided at that moment that he cannot stay here. He is actually being commissioned to help the people of Judah at this point now to go from here to there. And so he starts to have this conversation with God and, and he realizes he must do something and, he's, and the Lord starts to give him a passion and a mission, and that's where we're going to pick up in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, verse 1. It says this, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, just a reminder, uh, Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king, all right? He's got this privileged position as a servant in the house. And he said, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I love how the king actually pauses to see Nehemiah. We talked about this importance of being able to see people. The king is actually doing this for his servant. He actually sees something going on and he enters in and he engages. Nehemiah responds, he says, I was very much afraid. Now, what does Nehemiah have to be afraid of? Uh, I mean, he's, he's got this privileged position as a cupbearer of the king. Uh, but you, what you'll come to find out is that the cupbearer is not like buddy-buddy with the king. He's not like on first-name basis. He's not hanging out with the king, having conversations with the king. We find out a little bit later about this particular culture, that if you were to approach the king and it was to displease him, even if you were his wife, then like you could be killed. You could be executed for this purpose. And so he's afraid of what's going to happen. But this is what I love about Nehemiah. He had already determined in his heart what he needed to do. He already understood that he couldn't stay here and that he needed to use his influence, his leadership, and anything he had to be able to help get the people to there. And so he determined whatever the cost, I'm going to engage. And that's exactly what we see him doing. He says, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? He's defining reality for the king so he understands. And the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Guys, I love this. Just a little sidebar. I love this about Nehemiah and I hope it becomes true about myself and also you. We see that Nehemiah, when he's exposed to the reality of the situation, the very first thing he does is he goes to God in prayer and he fasts and he prays and he mourns and he asks God to be able to enter into the situation. And so he spends this moment of time in private prayer, but then in the midst of being in front of the king, it, like when everything is happening, even though God has put something on his heart, he pauses in the midst of what he is doing and he has a conversation with God. Father, I pray that you would do the same thing for me. Lord, I pray that the words that I would speak would be the things that you would need these guys to hear. Father, that if, if there is anything that I say that is not worthy of retaining, that you would let it fall from their ears. But Father, I pray that if there are things in which I communicate today about the vision of what you have for this church, Lord, that it would empower and it would impassion our people together. And then I answer the king, if it pleases the king, and if, you, if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. There it is. There it is. This time of conversation that, that Nehemiah has been having with the Lord, the Lord gives him a passion and he gives him a mission. And the mission is to help rebuild the city, is to help these guys get from here to there. That is what he's put on his heart. And so what we find out is this, the second job, the second job of a leader is to declare the destination. The first job is to define reality, but the second job is to declare the destination. What we see Nehemiah doing here is, I think, incredibly wise. He declares the destination first to, that, uh, to the person who's in leadership. 
He, he, he brings this to the king. He lets him know this is what God has put on my heart to do. And so I'm presenting this to you as, as my leader in this particular situation. What you guys need to understand is that as we have been talking about there for Sunnyside, the end game of where God is wanting to take us in this next stage of our ministry, I've been having conversations about there with our leadership from the very beginning of our conversations. When Eric approached me back in November about having a, a conversation about coming on to this team and, and, and whether or not this would be a good fit, I started having conversations with him because of the things that God had put in my heart about what, what, what I feel like a church could be, what it should be in this city and, and what God has put on my heart. And I started having conversations with him. And, and then when I was interviewing with the elders, having those kind of conversations with our elders and the leadership of this church before I ever came on as a team member. Because one of the things I wanted to do is make sure that the, the vision that God had put on my heart aligned with the vision that God had for this church. Because if it's not, then I'm the wrong person for this place. But as we started having conversation with the leadership, and we started having conversation with our elders, we started to realize that, that the vision that God's put on my heart is exactly what this church needs in this season, in this time of its life and its life cycle. And so just like the, the, the king did for Nehemiah, our eldership and our leadership has done for me. And they said, what is it you need? Let's go for this. Let's make this thing work together. And we're gonna talk more about that here in a minute. But first, I wanna go back to, to Nehemiah because we're not done with him yet. You see, the king gives him not only permission, he also gives him his blessing. And he sends Nehemiah not only with resources and letters of protection, but he also sends an army along with him so as to escort him to this place. And so Nehemiah is set up to be able to come into this place and to succeed and to, to rebuild the city as God has put in his heart. But I want, I want you to take a look at what Nehemiah's tact is and what he does. In, in verse uh, 12 and 13, it says this, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. All except for the king, he told the king, but he hadn't shared his vision with anybody else yet. He said, there were no mounts with me except the one that I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate. I don't know why anybody would want to live next to the dung gate, but it existed there, all right? And, and examining the walls of Jerusalem, that's what he was doing. He was examining, he was assessing, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Now, I, I, as I read this and I started thinking, if God has put this in Nehemiah's heart, why didn't he come in to the city? Why didn't he come in and just start sharing his vision with people, the things that he wanted to do and the things he wanted to accomplish? The reason why is I think that Nehemiah was an incredibly wise man. I, I think that he was a wise man to come into the city and even though it God had put a, a, a passion in his heart for the things that he wanted him to do from the outside looking in, he needed to spend some time, even if it was just three days, in the city being able to assess and evaluate and figure out things to be able to further define his vision and his mission before he started to present his mission and his vision. Now, any of you guys that have led anything, you've led somebody from here to there and God has given you uh, some kind of supernatural uh, mission or vision in mind, you'll understand what I mean by this, but with, with any there that comes, there's always a certain degree of ambiguity, a certain degree of uncertainty. You see, there oftentimes looks more like a, a, a blurry glimpse rather than a fixed image, doesn't it? And if you've been there before, you understand what I'm talking about. You see, God oftentimes gives us just a, a little glimpse of what the future could possibly be like. And it's clear enough to us to be able to pursue. But, but I think sometimes because of our own need for God's dependence or our dependence on God, that he only reveals a small portion of that so that we'll continue to go back to him. So we'll continue to have the conversations with him so that he can continue to revise that and, and define that for us in our dependency and our pursuit of him. And I feel like that's exactly what was going on in Nehemiah. It's certainly what's going on here. I think Nehemiah would have been remiss to show up on scene and start sharing his vision up front, coming right in. And he had, he had all the, the, you know, the king's people. He had all the letters. He had the resources. He could have come in and just started barking orders about where they're going and what they're doing. But he spent the time necessary to be able to figure out what is it exactly that needs to happen. And through that process, he started to realize in order to rebuild the city as God has called me to do, there's something else that I need to do in the first place. Guys, side note, let's have this conversation. You all need to understand that as I'm gonna talk to you guys about there today, um, I've, been, I've been spending the last two months 
having some conversations with people that are here as well as the people that are no longer here. I've been, I've been looking at information. We've been taking assessment. We've been evaluating our programs and our efforts and our platforms and all these kind of things. We've been putting the time in to be able to figure out what is it, God, that you need us to do and how is it that you wanna refine this vision for this particular place? You see, I've been doing this for the past couple months and some of you all might think that I should wait a little bit longer to be able to present some of this information to you. And guess what? I agree. <laughs> I agree. I, I, I think I, I should probably sit around and, and listen and evaluate a little bit further. But the problem is, is we've tar- started to take this assessment. I've had conversations with our elders and we started to define our reality. I've realized that I can't wait because we can't stay here any longer. We have to start moving towards the vision that God has given us. And in order for us to do that, I've gotta be able to declare the destination just as Nehemiah did. But it's gonna take some further refining. And that's not something that I can do on my own. That's something that we must do collectively and together. So take a look at how, uh, how Nehemiah enters into this situation. He sits there and he assesses and he evaluates and he observes. And then I said to them, he brings the people together and he has a conversation. He says, you see the trouble we're in? I love this. You see the trouble that we're in? Nehemiah just arrived three days ago, but he's already part of them. It's a we thing. It is us thing. We are gonna get together and we are going to do this collectively. This is not about me coming in and saving the day. This is about me coming in and saying, where is God taking us and how are we going to get there? Guys, I feel the exact same way. And some of you all might see see me as being an outsider. I've only been here two months. But guys, it's where we are gonna go. And then he goes on to define the reality for these guys. Jerusalem lies in ruins. You all know this. Its gates have been burned with fire. We're defining reality. We can't stay here any longer. So what are we gonna do? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. For those of you all that are wondering, Nehemiah was the Donald Trump of his day, all right? He's all about building walls. That's what he wants to do. And so, I'm just joking, of course, that's not at all the case, but anyway... (laughs) Uh, so he says, he, now catch this, all right? This is a different vision. This is a refined vision from what he told the king. His ultimate goal was to rebuild the city. He wants to rebuild this people group to be able to help them to be able to operate in the way that God has called them to do. But as he's gotten in there and as he's seen this, he says, okay, but I understand in order for us to do that, the very first thing we need to do is set up a perimeter. We need to build a wall. That is what we need to do. If we are going to be able to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish, we've got to set some parameters first. We've got to offer some protection and some guidance and some direction. And guys, that is is what I want to be able to do with you guys today. In the time remaining that I have of this message, I don't have enough time to be able to paint this, this super clear, beautiful picture of all that God wants to do in this place. And I'm not gonna try to get into the how. I'm not gonna talk about what needs to happen to get from here to there. That's actually a next week conversation. All I wanna do for you guys today is set up a perimeter to give you guys a direction, to clarify the mission that God has given us to refine that for us today. And so here it is, guys. Where is there? Where is there? Now, as I communicate this to you guys, I, I wanna give you all just a little bit of background and story so that you all know um, how I even got to there in the first place. You see, several years ago, uh, I was, um, I, before I committed to going to help plant Trace, Trace Church, which by the way, this church was a significant uh, and important part of that even happening, Um, But before that happened, Aaron had asked me to come up and be a part of this. And I started having a conversation with God about what he wanted me to do because I loved the church that I was a part of. But I started feeling like God was setting me free. He was releasing me from that particular ministry. And I wasn't sure if I was supposed to go help plant Trace or if I was supposed to do something else. And so I said, Lord, you're releasing me from this, but you've given me this skill set. You've given me this desire. And so give me a vision. Give me a vision for what it is that you would like me to do. And I'll go plant a church of my own, I'll go, I'll go lead another church organization if you would want me to. And so I started having this conversation with God and I started praying and I dedicated myself and I was fasting and, and God didn't give me nothing. Like it was, like, he didn't give me a vision. He didn't give me a vision. I'm like, come on God, I'm willing. I'll go, just send me, give me a vision. And he didn't give me a vision. 
And instead, instead he ended up giving me two people. He said, in this season of your life, I, I don't have a vision for you. What I want you to do is go support some other people's visions. And so uh, the two people he gave me was, was Aaron and to be able to go up and help to, to plant Trace Church, which was his vision. And, and I, I think they're doing incredible things over there at Trace. In addition to that, God also put on my heart to help lay the foundation for the vision that God has given my wife to, to do ministry for, the, for those that have mental illness and their family members. And, and so like that's something that's gonna be a significant part of, of our life and, and we'll be talking more about that as a church. But you all need to understand this. The relationship that I've always had with God is this. Lord, send me where you want me and make me be as content as I possibly can be for as long as you want me to be there. And then when you're ready to remove me from that, then you can give me a discontentment. Other than, other than that, don't make me discontent. And you all need to know this about me. I was completely content doing what God had called me to do in that season of ministry. Supporting and lifting up both Aaron, my best friend who's doing ministry over there, and my wife laying a foundation uh, for, for those that are mentally ill. I'm completely content until I started having some conversations with Eric. Darn that Eric, all right? <laughs> He's not here today, so I can say that. Started having conversations with Eric and he asked me if I would be willing to consider coming along this, this place. And what had happened kind of even previous to that, I'd, I'd been having some of these, these dreams and I didn't even know how to exactly interpret that. But after I started having conversations with, with Eric, I started, started gaining a passion and I started giving, getting some more direction and some things started to become solidified in my mind and I started to get a glimpse of where there was. I started to be given a, a vision of what God wanted me to do with the church. And that's when I started having conversations about whether or not Sunnyside was the right place for this vision to actually be enacted. And I felt like that is exactly what God is calling us to do. This is exactly the place that God is calling us to. Worthy of sacrificing, worthy of leaving what was going on over there, worthy of moving my family to be a part of something like this. And so here's, here's there. Guys, I'm gonna give it to you in one sentence. There is gonna be summarized today in, in a one sentence mission statement. And it's one that I want you to become familiar with because we're gonna be talking a lot about that. And then I'm gonna break it up a little bit and talk to you all about the different elements and the pieces that make up this statement. But our new mission here is this. We are a people following Jesus to those not yet. We are a people following Jesus to those not yet. Now, guys, here's the deal. Today, in the time that I have, I'm not gonna be able to fully unpack this, but I'm gonna give you all a few little bullet points to be able to help to put your mind around this so that you all can then start asking the questions that we need to ask in order to get from here to there together. And it starts with this. We are a people. Now, most of us understand this. We are not a place. We, we are not a location. We are not a building. We are the ecclesia of Jesus Christ. We are the gathering of the body of Christ. And as we talked about last week, every single local expression of the body of Christ has an individual mission and a their statement that allows us to be able to uniquely and specifically be equipped and prepared to be able to accomplish our mission differently than any other church. We are a people gathering together. And if we don't get that, guys, then we don't get any of the rest of this. Because if we don't get together and we, if we don't start understanding that where we go is where our mission is, where we go is where the church is, where we go is where the party is, all right? Where, wherever we go, is, that is the people. We are a people. We are not a church in the sense of the word that most people would understand, church. We have to start seeing ourselves as being a people. And this is what you need to understand. Every person that makes up this people has a place in this mission. Every person that makes up this people has a place in this mission. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if this is your very first weekend here or you've been here for 50 years. You have a significant and important place and part to play in this mission called Sunnyside. We are a people following Jesus to those not yet. And if we're gonna be a people, we gotta start to get to know each other better than we even do now. We gotta start getting to know each other's stories. We gotta start getting involved in each other's lives. Uh, those of you guys who sit in this section don't even know the people over there because you sit in the same section the whole time and these people, they don't even know you because they sit in the balcony and I've closed that off already, all right? So, but here's the deal. This is one of the, the unique situations that we have at this place and time in our life as a church is that we're not too big not to know each other. We're not too big not to know when somebody new walks into this church. We're not too big 
not to be able to be intimately involved in each other's lives. Now, we can't do that for everyone, but we can know each other's names and each other's faces and each other's stories incrementally better than what we do now. And guys, we're gonna need to. We're gonna need to because this mission, this vision that we have laid out for us is not gonna be easy. This is gonna be challenging. It's gonna require us going to, to new places that we've never been, trying things that we've never tried, em, embracing some difficulties, even failing at times. And the only way that we're gonna be able to accomplish this mission is hand in hand, arm in arm, as a people, one people. Not, not a church divided, not a church in a church as, as the assessment has been given about this church before I even came here, as one body of believers, young and old, doing this together. We are a people following Jesus. Guys, this is, where it, this is where it all starts, following Jesus. Guys, the, the, the one thing that I might be able to present to you guys, the very best that I can do as an example in my own life, but also kind of working to your all's life, the very best thing that I could do for you is to help you fall more in love with Jesus. I was reminded of this as my wife and I were, were praying and, and thinking about what is it that we need to do as a church? And, and I wanna talk about all the strategy and I wanna talk about this organizational thing and talk about the structure and talk about these platforms and I wanna work all that stuff. And she reminded me, we just need to help them fall more in love with Jesus. We need, to, we need to help them to be able to see Jesus for who he truly is, the Lord and Savior of our life. And many of you guys have already accepted that. You already know that. But the world around us does not need more Christians it does not need more churches. It needs more people that are actually passionately pursuing and following Jesus, obeying his commands, doing what he's asked us to do, putting our verbs into practice, living our lives as if, as if we were actually disciples of his. Not people that just show up to a service on Sunday or people who check off a box because they went to a group on Wednesday, but people who are actually taking the things that we're talking about and applying it to their life. And I know that that is your desire, but as a group collectively, there are things that we can do to help us to accomplish that even better. One of the ways in which I try to live my life by a mantra that I live my life by is reckless obedience. Lord, as you tell me, as you call me, as I hear your voice, I will do it immediately, recklessly, whatever it costs me. Father, I'll go, just send me, but make it clear to me. That is what I want for my life. That is what I want for this church, for us to follow Jesus in that way, whatever it takes. I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, he says it this way. He says, um, Jesus called us to come and die. He said, if you wanna follow me, if you wanna be my disciple, you gotta deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. That's what this world needs. That's what this country needs. That's what this city needs. We need people that are passionately pursuing Jesus. And that's not an easy thing for us to take on. It's not something that's gonna overnight change in us. It is gonna be something that is gonna progressively change in us, but we're gonna need some guidance. We need some, some guardrails to be able to help us to be able to do this collectively so that we can do this individually. And so uh, following Jesus, it's a big task, right? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna narrow this down to a couple of, of core verbs, as we're gonna call these things, core verbs that help us to be able to follow Jesus better. And I truly believe if we are to put these verbs into practice, we're gonna end up looking more like followers of Jesus and not just Christians by name. And so here are the verbs, all right? Here are the verbs. We see, we serve, we share, and we send. Matter of fact, we got four sections here today. You all gonna be the C section, all right? You are gonna be the serve section. You are gonna be the share section and you are gonna be the sin section. You all ready for this? All right, I'm gonna point to you and I want you to say this out loud. Are you ready? We, 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 we. that was really bad, but <clears throat> we'll get there. We'll get there. Now guys, in and of themselves, these are just words, right? But when you start to put action behind this, you start to put culture behind this, you start to put accountability behind this, all of a sudden these become so much more than just verbs or words or things that we're trying to do. You see, accountability, accountability is put in place not to make us feel bad about what we didn't do, it's to help us become the people that God has called us to be. And, and as a church, what happens is when we start to put some questions behind these particular verbs, and, you, and we've already been talking about most of these over the summer when we talked about these verbs, but, but when we talk about seeing the question we're asking, whose story did you see this week? 
We've, we've been asking that already, right? But when you stop to see whose story are you seeing this week, all of a sudden you're putting yourself in a position to be able to see people as God sees them and to be able to enter into the story wherever he wants you to. And, and when you start talking about serving, who are you serving? Not whose team are you serving on? I, I, that is a valuable thing. We need people to serve here in these walls. But if that's, the, if that's how we're confining serving, man, we are missing out on the picture. We need to start thinking about who we are serving, not just what team we're serving on. And so every day, every week, every month, we're thinking, who is it that I'm putting myself in a position to put a towel over my arm and to love on and to serve that person inside and outside of the walls of these church? Who are you sharing what you know with? Who are you sharing with? The things that we have in our possession, the resources that we have, the things that God has put in our possession, the things that he continues to give us as we read through scripture and we start to share things, the things that you hear today, who are you sharing with? And the only one that we've not talked about yet is who are you sending out? Who are you investing in? Who are you loving on? Who are you pouring your life into so that they can actually take this mission along with them wherever they go? And they can be able to accomplish the mission of this church with or without you. We are a people following Jesus to those not yet. To those not yet. Now this is probably the most confusing and also probably the most intriguing part of our mission statement. And this is purposely done. This is something that, that we've said, you know what, we want to cause a little degree of question and a little degree of inquiry so that not only whenever you remember this, but also when somebody else asks, it prompts a question and it prompts a response to those not yet. You know, I heard a preacher not long ago, he started to talk about the division and how we define uh, kind of the, the world around us. And we talk about believers and unbelievers. He said, guys, I don't, under, I don't understand why we ever use that terminology, believer and unbeliever. He says, as I see it, as I read it, every single knee is going to bow and every single tongue is gonna confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They're all gonna be believers someday. The question is whether or not we're gonna get to them before that day comes. Are, are, are they gonna come willingly to believe in Jesus to make that declaration? Or are they gonna have to do it forcefully? Guys, our hope is that we would get to them before that happens because they're just not yet. They're not there yet. But the way that this whole concept came to me, the, the way that this word has stuck out into me, and, and I love this, this imagery of those not yet because now it's not somebody who's not ever, it's just somebody who's just not yet. Maybe they're waiting for us to be able to come to them, for us to enter in and to engage into their life in a way that they can actually be a part of the body of Christ. <clears throat> I, I was at Trace a few years ago and I'd received a, a card, not unlike this one, Joe had mentioned this earlier, it's our Connect card, but on, on the backside there's a prayer card and I'd gotten this prayer card after service and I started reading this card and it was uh, in, a, in a woman's handwriting and she, she begins to share her story on the back of this card. And she says, uh, I've been here for the past three weeks, but today was the first time I entered into the doors of your church. You see, the, the, the past two weeks, I came to your church and I sat in my car and I just couldn't get out. I couldn't work up the courage because of some things that had happened to me in the past to be able to enter into the doors and come into your church. She went on to say, I'm so glad that I entered into the church because I felt welcomed here. And for the first time in a long time, I felt like someone saw me and that I was loved. <laughs> and then on the flip side of the card where it, where it has a place for the name, she wrote, not yet. Not yet. I stared at that and I thought about that. Man, we got a lot of not yets around us. She was not yet ready to identify herself. Previous to that week, she was not yet ready to enter into the doors of a church. Previous to that, she was not even yet ready to, to get back on the, the wagon and to, to even give church a chance. We've got a lot of not yets around us. People that are not yet surrendered to him. People that have not yet made their faith their own. People that are not yet following Jesus the way that he has called us to follow him as a disciple. 
people that are not yet coming to this church or entering into the doors, people that are not yet ready to make their marriage work, people that are not yet able to give up that addiction or to to make that confession or to forgive their abuser or to seek the help that they need, they are not yet. But we're a people following Jesus to those not yet. Wherever they happen to be in their journey with Jesus, we're gonna meet them there and we're gonna walk with them so that they can be. They're just not yet. And that may be a a decision to actually follow Jesus Christ like we are. It may be a decision to be able to make their marriage work or to overcome overcome that addiction or to make their faith their own for our kids that are in the the room. Guys, they're just not yet. But we're a people following Jesus to those that are not yet. You know, when Nehemiah shared his vision with the people, I love, I love how they responded in verse 18. In verse 18, they replied, I get it. Let us start rebuilding. So they began the good work. They heard the, the simple vision. They heard what, what needed to happen. They said, let's rebuild a wall. This is where there is. This is where we need to start. These are the parameters. So what are we gonna do? Let's begin. The vision is clear It's going to be hard. There's lots of things along the way. We're going to talk about that next week, but at least it's clear. And so they began the good work and they worked arm in arm. And there was a group of people who started to rebuild the wall in this part. And then there was another group of people who got together and they started to rebuild the wall in their particular area of the neighborhood. And then there's another group of people, and I love this. It talks about grandparents and grandkids and their kids getting together and working together to be able to rebuild the wall because that was the vision set before them. And they said, let's do this together, arm in arm. Let's go at this together. Collectively, they heard a mission, they heard a vision, they saw it there, and they said, let's do it. Let's do it. Now, I'm gonna ask you guys to do something for me. I'm gonna ask that you all, to everybody stand? Those that you they can, if you can't stand, that's fine. You can stay seated, but everybody else, I want you to stand. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make this awkward. I'm not gonna make you hold hands. <clears throat> I want you to lock arms, <laughs> okay? I, honestly, what I want you to do is the person next to you, I, you might not know them. Introduce yourself real quick, all right? And lock arms with somebody. And then I, I want you, if you can, extend across the aisle to somebody. If you see somebody who can't stand, who can't, is sitting right now, I want you to lock arms across the rows. We are not yet big enough to be able to fill this room, all right? <laughs> I just divided the church. This is awesome, all right. All right, listen up. We talked about this already. We are a people following Jesus to those not yet. The only way that we get there is to do this like this here. This is it. We unite ourselves under one common mission, over one common vision, over one clear there so that we can actually begin to do the work that God has set apart for this church to do at this very time together. And we will call out and we will declare that we are a people following Jesus to those not yet. As a matter of fact, I want you all to repeat after me. We are a people following Jesus to those not yet. And anytime you hear somebody from stage be able to say, we are a people following Jesus, what I want you to say is to those not yet. We are a people following Jesus. I said, we are a people following Jesus. We are a people following Jesus. Guys, I see a people who gather regularly united in a mission and a purpose. Not half-hearted, but fully engaged in worship to our God by loving the people that are not yet a part of us. Where more baptisms happen outside of these walls than happen inside of these walls. Where our youth are making their faith their own while they're in our homes, and then they leave from us influencers as we send them out. We are a gathering full, uh, fully that reflects our neighborhood with people of all ethnicities, languages, ages, ranges, economic status, We see people every day that the rest of the world might overlook. We are trying new things because we realize that we cannot stay here. And in order to be able to reach people that nobody else are reaching, we are going to do things that no one else is trying. 
We raise up people from our church who will carry our mission to new churches all throughout the city, all throughout this country, and all throughout this world. We are a community where change is welcome because we don't want to become stagnant and become a statistic. We become such an important part of our community that the city and our neighbors would uprise and beg us not to go if for some reason we decided we wanted to leave this particular place because we matter that much to them. We know our neighbors and the kids over here at Madison Elementary, whether they ever show up to this building or not, they are exposed to the love of Jesus. <clears throat> I, see a people living in, I see people living in the darkness of mental illness, but being exposed to the light of hope through this gathering of believers. We are a place that our elder members are revered and respected because they're pouring into the latter years of their life into the youth of this particular body. We are people who don't get sidetracked on the things that are not mission critical, where the young and old walk side by side in stride toward our end game because we are a people following Jesus, whatever it takes. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning. <laughs> thank you for this passion. That you put inside my heart. Lord, I know I don't do justice to even being able to communicate it. But Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to impress this upon the hearts of those people who make up this place, who've called this place their home, who've dedicated themselves to this ministry, who are gonna be able to make the turn to where there is because they're not gonna be stuck in here any longer because they know that we've been set apart for something so much greater. There is greater glory in the days to come than what there has been even in the past. And Father, you get credit for that. I pray that you would unite us together under this mission and under this vision. Let us be a people following your son to the far stretches of this world to those that are not yet a part of us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.